So we're starting chapter 22 here, magnetism. Uh, unfortunately, without getting into relativity, you're not going to fully understand magnetism, and maybe not even then. Uh, you know, that's one of those philosophical things. Do we ever really fully understand something? But the idea is that magnetism is something that we can use, and it works really well, but we absolutely do not need it. Um, we can explain everything with the electric force, with Coulomb's force, if we also include uh, special relativity. If we don't include special relativity, then we have to we we have to look at it as though it's this magnetism, and it's going to be very different than any other force you've looked at so far, right? Forces we looked at before, like the direction the field was pointed, that was where your force was going to go. You're not going to find that to be the case here, and it's because of that result of it having to do with relativity, uh, which. It's absolutely fascinating, but we don't have time to get into here. Uh, but essentially, I guess we could just say magnetic fields in a very uh, kind of shallow and very watered down way are just moving electric fields. And it's because of that motion of the electric fields that we get these kind of properties that we're gonna see here. Uh, so we're gonna start off, uh, we'll learn about magnetic fields, magnetic fields, acting on moving charges. They do not act on stationary charges. Uh, we're gonna talk about how moving charges uh, will, will uh, like what their path will be inside of a magnetic field. Uh, we'll see some uh, interesting things like the idea that magnetic fields do no work. They apply forces, but they don't do work. We'll see what kind of forces they apply on charged particles, what they apply on current carrying wires and loops and how they interact with those things. Uh, we'll see how current carrying wires create magnetic fields and what kind of magnetic fields they create. Uh, we'll look at currents going through loops and solenoids and what kind of magnetic fields they create and then some magnetism inside of matter. So first off, we're gonna look at permanent magnets. One of the things that's always the case, and it's similar to charges, is if charges we had plus and minus, we had positive charges and negative charges, and they were like opposites. The like charges repel and the opposite charges attract. Similarly here, we have two different poles, not charges, poles, uh, and we call one north and one south. And just like with electric charges, opposite poles attract, like poles repel. So a north will attract to a south and a south will attract to a north, but north repel, repel north and south repel other south. And you can see that here. The thing that is different from the electric charge is you cannot isolate one of these poles. That's why it's not called magnetic charge. They are poles. Every time you have a north, you have a corresponding south. You can't separate them. If you take a magnet and you cut it in half, you will end up with two north-south magnets. So you start with your one north-south magnet, you cut it in half, you end up with two. If you're thinking of this microscopically, it's like if we could zoom right down into here, what we would see right down, not just to the atom, but to the electrons themselves. The electrons themselves are tiny little north-south magnets. So what you essentially have is a bunch of north-south magnets all pointed this way. Okay? And so you have like north, south, north, that's an N, south, like this. And so if you split it, you end up coming over here and you still have south, north, little magnets like that in the new piece of bar that you broke apart. And then this one over here is still the same sort of thing. And so what you end up with is overall, again, a north here and a south here, 
a south here and a north here when you split it, even down to the subatomic level. Yes. So, like, what is a magnetic field? <laughs> a material that emits a magnetic field and has a north and south pole. I don't know. I'd go with that. Um, the electrons themselves are a north-south pole because they have spin. You heard of electron spin in your chemistry classes? So it's a tiny bit of internal angular momentum of the electron itself that gives the electron itself a north-south pole. The orbit of the electron, like the electron cloud going around the nucleus, creates a north-south magnet. That one's called diamagnetism. So you have different kinds of magnetism. You have ferromagnetism, ferrimagnetism, diamagnetism, paramagnetism, and they come from different sources. And every single one of them has to do with the motion of a charge. So moving charges create magnetic fields. It's really just moving electric fields that we are, that look like another field to us from our perspective. Okay? It's a moving electric field, but yes, we're treating it as a totally separate, but somehow related entity. Okay. All right. So we were doing electrostatics before where the stuff was stationary. Then we went to the currents moving in the last one. And now we're going to see what kind of fields those moving currents make. Is essentially it. All right. So just be patient. Bear with me. We'll get there. All right. Magnetic fields. So previously we talked about in uh, electrostatics, we had electric field lines. They left from positive charges and either went off to infinity or they ended, they terminated on a negative charge. So electric fields, they either, they either went or came from infinity started at positive or ended at negative, right? That was it, out of positive into negative. Here, it's a little different. We talked about that with the electrostatics where I said that the electric field diverges, okay? It spreads out as it goes. Turns out magnetic fields, they have no divergence. So the electric fields, they have no curl. They'll never make something spin just by, by a stationary electric field. These things have that curl. And so essentially what I'm saying here is any electric field line you follow is either going to take you to terminating on a negative charge or take you out to infinity forever. Any magnetic field line you follow will eventually lead you back to where you started. All magnetic field lines form closed loops. They do not diverge. They don't go off and spread out. They form closed loops. So if you look at this, it is pretty similar. If you just, if you ignored this part right in the middle, this would be kind of similar looking to the positive negative charges that we had before, right? Where the field would go out and curve over like this, right? Remember that, these pictures? And it would curve like this and curve like that and come in over here and stuff. So it would be very similar in form, except inside the magnet itself, these field lines continue. So this one that comes out of north goes all the way around through the inside of the magnet and back to where it started. So all these field lines form closed loops as long as you actually go through the material or whatever is actually creating the magnetic field. So all magnetic field lines, they form closed loops, and these loops will point out of the north and loop back around into the south and then go from the south to the north, south to the north like that, again, all the way back up to north. Okay? So they form these closed loops. So very similar in looks when we draw them to the electrostatic positive negative thing, but we can't separate them. If we could separate them, then they would not form closed loops anymore. So essentially by saying all the field lines form closed loops, it's another way of saying no magnetic monopoles. They're always a dipole. Have y'all learned about dipole moments? See, there you go. 
All right. Here, uh, we can come up with different kinds of magnets. This one is a very nice kind of magnet that makes a very strong magnetic field on one side and a very weak one on the other just by putting the north-souths all next to each other. And you see this in those like those, uh, they probably sometimes go on refrigerators. Those like, it'll be like a magnet. Like you might get one for poison control or there's a magnet that goes on your car. It has a very strong magnetic field when you are near to it, but when you are far away, it is not. So like if you have it closer, it doesn't do anything. If you get it just slightly up, it comes right off. But when it's flat on there, it's kind of hard to get off, right? That's because you have this kind of an arrangement going on. And if you look at the backside, where it's the magnetic side, you can actually, and they're showing it here, you can see all these lines in it. You can actually see the lines in it of where they have the different magnetic uh, things all, all lined up like that to create that. All right, so they exit from north and enter to south and they always form closed loops and they never cross. They never cross. Just like electric fields, we never cross. They would combine up to make a new field that doesn't, doesn't cross. Earth acts like a giant magnet. Uh, it's an actual great mystery of what is the first planetary object to have a magnetic field. You see, Earth gets a magnetic field because you have to have a magnetic field to jumpstart it. So the idea is that the uh, the core of Earth is moving, and therefore it's that motion that creates this magnetic field. But just having that move doesn't create the magnetic field. You have to have it move inside a magnetic field, so then it then makes its own magnetic field. So then you ask the question, well, what magnetic field started Earth's magnetic field? And you say, well, the sun's. Well, then what magnetic field started the sun's magnetic field? And it's actually a pretty big mystery of what was, you know, what started that kind of a thing, okay? So we don't really know that. But uh, as you can see here, if you take a look at this picture, this very much resembles just a bar magnet, except what do you see a little peculiar about this picture? What do you see on that bar magnet? Huh? The north is on the south pole and the south is up at the north pole. Is that like just a mistake in the picture? Absolutely not. This is actually how it is. If you think about it, you hold a compass and the north end of your compass is going to point towards the north pole. That's the geographic north pole because the north pole of your magnet is actually going to be attracted to the what of the earth, the whole planet's the South Pole. So geographic north is actually magnetic south. And magnetic south is geographic north. I think I said the same thing twice there. Geographic south is magnetic north. Okay? So that's, uh, that's kind of important. You can see on here where the magnetic field lines would be the strongest, where you'd get the strongest uh, magnetic fields due to... Uh, Personally, that's going to be up here around the north and down here around the south. What is something that you can see at nighttime if you're really far north or really far south that you can't see here? The aurora borealis. What actually happens with this, the idea is that charged particles coming from space from the sun get trapped in the magnetic field. They actually end up spiraling, so we'll talk about that later. And they spiral down and follow these magnetic field lines where they are pulled into the atmosphere, where they bombard the atmosphere and you see light. This does not happen over here because the magnetic fields aren't pulling them down into the atmosphere near the equator. It's only far up north and far down south that that really happens. And you get the northern lights, the aurora borealis. That does happen in the south too, doesn't it? I think so, right? I'm not crazy about that, but I just suddenly started thinking, wait a second, do they all go north? I think it goes north and south. Um, anyway, there you go. So geographic north, magnetic south. The magnetic force, there you go. 
The force on a moving charged particle is the magnitude of that charged particle times the speed of that particle times the strength of the magnetic field times the sine of the angle between the direction of the velocity and the magnetic field. 2VB sine theta. If you are pretty good with vector mass, you can actually have this be V cross B for cross products. You don't have to remember that, but that's what that is. Yes. V is the speed with which that charged particle is moving. V. B. B is the magnetic field. If you had, no, nobody you had me for calculus three, huh? Anybody ever have calc three? Oh, no. Okay. Well, then, then you're not going to understand why it's called a B field. Okay. If you ever take calculus three and you get a book that uses the, that thing, it has to do with its a, a way of its a way of finding a, I think it was, I believe it's called a binormal field. So anyway, it won't make sense to you. That comes from mathematics. It's called a B field. And it has to do with because it's normal to the direction that the force occurs. All right. It's the binormal field. And so this, Experiment. If you if you if you do this, um, you don't get the same kind of stuff you would think. All right, we're gonna have to come up with some new rules to figure out what's going on here. All right, because anybody know about cross products? Anybody? Yeah. What happens if you take the cross product of two parallel vectors? You get zero. So not only do you have to have your charges moving, they have to have at least some component of their motion be perpendicular to the magnetic field. If they are moving parallel to the magnetic field, like in that case right there, there's going to be no force. There's going to be no magnetic force. All right. If they are moving absolutely perpendicular to the magnetic field, you will get maximum force. If they're moving somewhere in between, then you have to worry about the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field, sine of theta. So if sine of theta is the sine of zero, it's zero. If it's the sine of 90 degrees, it's one, that's a maximum. And then anything in between is between zero and one. Okay, so you have to pay close attention to that angle. All right, and then we have to also come up with a way to tell what direction that force is in, because you notice we haven't said that yet. We've only said there is a force and what its magnitude is, not what direction it is. Here, we can define our magnetic field like this, but just by rearranging that previous equation, uh, our unit, our SI unit for this is going to be the Tesla. It is a Newton per amp meter. Okay, that is a Tesla. You've probably all heard of the cars, the Tesla cars, right? And then, or the company. And then that's also named after a guy who did a lot of work on magnetism. Okay, so we can just define it like that. A and, and you'll often probably even hear me refer to it as a B field. A lot of people will say that. Huh? Because it's Q times V. So Q times V is Coulomb times meter per second. And then we made that Coulomb per second times meter, which is an amp times a meter. So just to simplify it down. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. The direction of the force on a moving charge. You're gonna end up using your right hand for this. It's called the right hand rule. Anybody who's had any physics before, 
it's always the most fun test to sit here and watch a bunch of students sit here and try to like twist their hand around to figure out the directions of force. It's very entertaining. So one of my favorite tests to give. So let's see what Matt, what right hand, there are different versions of the right hand rule. And there are even some books that'll tell you a left hand rule. Um, honestly, it's different people like different versions of it. And so if you don't like the one I give or the one the book gives, then, you know, go look up another one because there, there are other, there's other ways to do it that'll work and give you the same answers. So for this one, what you are going to do is you're going to take your right hand and this is true for positive charges. You are gonna point your fingers in the direction of the velocity of the particle. You are then going to rotate your hand such that your palm is pointed toward the magnetic field so that when you curl your fingers in, they're curling toward the magnetic field, which you can see here in this picture. So you can see the fingers pointed in the direction of the velocity. So if I had pointed my fingers like this and I curl my fingers, they'd be going down. And notice the magnetic field is, is going back into like the screen, right? So for this one, I would have to, if I put my hand like this, that's curling down. That's not the direction of the magnetic field. If I put my hand like this, that's curling up. That's not the direction of the magnetic field. I'd have to put my hand this way and curl back into the screen, right? This is supposed to be like a three-dimensional picture. And I curl back into the screen. And then my thumb, put my thumb out like that, will point the direction of the force. All right. This is uh, this is a right hand rule because the people that came up with cross products and stuff were mostly right handed people, so they get the preference. Right handed rule. Okay. So fingers in the direction of the velocity, curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So you get to turn your palm so that when your fingers curl, they're turning toward that magnetic field. Thumb points out the direction of the force for a positive charge. Anybody want to guess what you do for a negative charge? Some people like to just use their left hand, right? I put my left hand like this. I'd have to turn it over this way, curl towards the B field, and the force would be down. Other people, myself included, just use my right hand, and then remember that if it's a negative charge, it's just the opposite of the way my thumb is pointed, right? Because if I do my right hand, it's that. If I do my left hand, it's that. They just they go in opposite directions. Okay. So if you end up creating particles in a particle collider or a mag in, in some sort of experiment, if you shoot them through a magnetic field, you can immediately tell if they are positive or negative charge just by looking at which direction they go. Do they go up or do they go down? Or you know what I mean? They'll, the positives will go one way and the negatives will go another way. And it gives you that kind of a feel there. So any questions on that? It's one of those things you just got to practice a few times until you get good at it. Okay, fingers in the direction of the velocity, curl them towards the magnetic field, thumb points out the direction of the force on a positive charge, opposite direction for the force for a negative charge. This also is what allows us to determine the direction of whether or not it's of electric current. Remember how I said we guessed it was positive to negative, but it turned out to be negative positive. This sort of thing actually allows us to determine that. If you send your current through a, like a metal plate and you have a perpendicular magnetic field, you can determine if it's the positive or negative charges moving. Because if it was the positive charges moving, they'd move to one side, right? They'd like all go to the top and you'd get a voltage pointed this way. If it's the negative charges moving, they go the other way, and, and then you get a magnetic, you, you'd get an electric field or a voltage pointed in the other direction. And that's actually the experiment that showed us that it was the negative charges that were moving. You have to, you have to include a magnetic field to do it. So it's one of the few situations where it does actually matter. Okay. Here is the actual full relationship: F equals Q V cross B. Cross products multiply all the perpendicular parts of a vector together. If nothing is perpendicular, it's zero. Dot products, have we done dot products before? 
they'll have to have done dot products, right? No? No dot, yes, some dot product people. Dot products multiply all the parallel parts of a vector together. If the vectors are perpendicular, you get zero. Cross products multiply all the perpendicular parts together. If they are parallel, you get zero. Okay? Which is why if V and B are parallel, you will get nothing. And so this just goes back to our F equals Q V B sine theta. Anytime you see that cross product, it's going to be the magnitude of the two multiplied together times the sine of the angle between them. Okay, but it's all three vectors put together and they're all, you know, that, that force is perpendicular to both V and B. Okay, so F is perpendicular to B. F is perpendicular to B. Okay. Say that again. Not here. It's the force of the magnetic field. Yes. The magnetic field. I know. The force of the magnetic field has, you know, is equal to the magnetic field. Yes, I know. A little different than what we've done before. Okay. So we get that. Now, if we take a look at this, and uh, we think about what kind of motion this is going to cause. It's only going to cause things to turn. If the force that you're applying is always perpendicular to the direction of motion that you're moving, it's going to make you turn, right? If this is going this way and I apply a force perpendicular to it, what does it do? It makes it start to turn, right? And if as it turns, I also adjust the force to constantly be perpendicular to it, it's just going to keep making it turn, right? And so it's going to make it go in a circular path, all right? It's going to make it go in loops. Now, if we think back to work, work is, if you remember, uh, where do I have room here? Let me, I guess I can put it here. Remember, work is F dotted with D, it was a dot product, which is F D cosine theta, right? What does that mean for the work done by a force that is perpendicular to the displacement? It's zero. Everywhere that the magnetic field is pointed, it's pointed perpendicular to the velocity, therefore it is always perpendicular to the displacement. So how much work can a magnetic field do? Zero. In fact, if you ever find a situation where you think you've come up with a place where a magnetic field is doing work, it is not the magnetic field doing work. It is the induced electric field that is doing the work. So you think, well, wait a second, if I grab a magnet, and I hold it over top of some paper clips, the paper clips will shoot up to it. It's not the magnetic field doing that. It's the induced electric field that gets induced by you moving the magnet near them. Okay? It's moving. A changing magnetic field creates an electric field, and a changing electric field creates a magnetic field. It's that changing electric field that is actually doing the work. Magnetic fields do no work. They can only change something's direction. They cannot get, give or take away kinetic energy. They can only redirect stuff. And kinetic energy is a scalar, so it doesn't care about the direction. That doesn't change the kinetic energy. All right? So you can see here, if we apply an electric field to something, it can actually increase its speed, right? That force is applied originally here perpendicular to the velocity, but after that, the force direction doesn't change, even though the velocity's direction has changed. And therefore, from that point on, it starts to increase the speed and therefore adds kinetic energy and does work. If you look at a magnetic field, 
That is not the case. At every location, when the particle's velocity changes, so does the direction of the force to always stay perpendicular. Therefore, it just makes something go in a loop and does no work, okay? So we have two very different kinds of motion here. In fact, if we were outside of this box and we, we fired a charged particle into it from outside the magnetic field, it would just turn it around and send it back at us. All right, that's what we can hope for, is just for it to be deflected. Have you all ever seen those bubble chamber pictures from the particle colliders where they have all the little swirls and stuff? Oh, well then never mind. Okay, any questions on this so far? Yeah. Wait, what are you dropping? Okay. Spinning in half a circle. No, it starts to turn. It doesn't add, it doesn't start it to rotating. It doesn't add, it, so it's not like if I took like a, say I had a charged sphere and I threw it into a magnetic field, it wouldn't start spinning the sphere. It would just make the sphere do this and come back out. It's not necessarily gonna make it start spinning. It's just changing the direction. How, work is change in kinetic energy. Show me where the kinetic energy changed. Right? So they just, they don't do work. If, if there is work, it's done. So like, say I want to, if I'm sweeping up the floor and I'm sweeping the dirt up off the floor, who's doing the work, me or the broom? Can, can the broom do work? No, 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 no. I can do work through the broom. I can do work through a magnetic field by changing it. So I change that magnetic field, that then is what does the work. It's still me doing the work. Okay, if I grab a magnet and I hold it over those paper clips and lift them up, it's because I did it. It's not because the magnet did it. A static magnetic field does no work. Changing magnetic fields induce electric fields and those electric fields do work. But the magnetic field itself doesn't do anything except change directions. And I know that is kind of hard to grasp, but it just is the case, right? Like Earth's orbiting the sun. How much work is, is the sun doing on Earth? If we assume it's just a circular orbit, you know, take best case scenario, then uh, none. It's just going around in a circle, right? It's not changing the kinetic energy of the planet or anything like that. Now, technically, it's going in a lip, so it does speed up sometimes and slow down other times, but the overall net exchange should be back to zero, I believe. So it's just making things go in a circle. Okay. In fact, um, the way most power is generated, not uh, other than like in a, a, a battery, like where it's done chemically, it ultimately ends up being move a big magnet near a coil of wires and create electricity. Uh, so like if you, if you make a, a hydroelectric dam, you have water at the top, you let the water rush down through a giant turbine, it spins the turbine, the turbine spins a magnet near a coil of wires, it creates electricity. You want a nuclear power plant, you use the nuclear material to create heat and heat some water, turn it into steam, and you push that steam through a turbine, it spins a turbine, it spins a giant magnet near a coil of wires, it creates electricity. If you're gonna burn something, a fuel or something like that, uh, a garbage, coal, gasoline, you, you, you burn it, you use that motion from that heat to maybe even heat steam or just, you know, like if it's an alternator on a car engine, it just, just moves the piston, spins a magnet near some wires and creates electricity. In fact, if you ever look at an alternator in a car, you can look inside and see the, the bunches of loops of wire that are all inside it. And inside there, it's spinning that magnetic field. So it's not the magnet though, that's doing the work to create the electricity. It's whatever's making the magnet spin. 
the, the superheated water, the, the potential energy of the water in the dam, the, the thermal energy from the, from the nuclear material, the chemical energy from you combusting some sort of fuel. Those are the things doing the work, not the magnets themselves. All right, any other questions here? You wanna take a look at some of the questions now? Okay. What is this, chapter 22, right? Chapter 22 examples. Haven't gotten to do these yet, so let's hope this goes well. Particle one with a charge of Q1 equals 3.6 microcoulombs and a speed V1 of 862 meters per second travels at right angles to a uniform magnetic field. The magnetic force it experiences is 4.25 times 10 to the negative three Newtons. Uh, particle two with a charge of 53 microcoulombs and a speed of 1.3 times 10 to the third meters per second moves at an angle of 55 degrees relative to the same magnetic field. Find A, the strength of the magnetic field and B, the magnitude of the magnetic force exerted on particle two. So in order to draw these, we have to draw three dimensional pictures on two dimensional pieces of paper and screens, right? So one of the things that you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to draw arrows that point out of the page and into the page. So if we say, for example, have a magnetic field pointed this way and we have a velocity pointed this way, then of whatever this charged particle is, positive or negative, right? If it's positive, our force has to point out of the page. If it's negative, it has to point into the page. Do we want to sit here and try to draw three-dimensional looking pictures all the time? Like you kind of did with the, you know, with the X, Y, Z plane or the X, Y, Z axes, right? That's going to get to be a pain. So what we actually do is we have two ways to do this. <clears throat> and depending upon what you're looking at, it's done kind of differently. So the idea is to draw a picture that looks like an arrow, like an arrow pointed at you or an arrow pointed away from you with like, with like feathers on the end of it. So if you're drawing a vector pointed out of the page, it is either done as just a dot or sometimes a dot with a circle around it. Like it's the tip of the arrow pointed at you. This would be out of the page. If you're drawing it into the page, you draw an X, like it's the tail feathers of it. An X or an X with a circle around it. I think the circles around them are, are tending to be left off a lot now. And you'll just see a bunch of dots. Like say we had a uniform magnetic field pointed out of the page, then they'd just draw a bunch of dots like this. And then this would be the region where the magnetic field was pointed out. And a uniform magnetic field into the page would just be a bunch of Xs like this. Sometimes you still find stuff with a circle around them, but more often than not, it's left off. And so this would be in, into, is that one word? I'll just make like a kind of space there, into the page. So for that one? Do my fingers in the direction of the velocity. Turn my palm up to the magnetic field, curl, point it out of the page. So if this was a positive charge, I'd put a dot there because it would be coming out of the page. If it was a negative charge, I would have either done my left hand. I'm so nervous. I'm going to step off the back of these stairs. I would have done. I would. Have, I would have done my right hand and then just said, "No, it's into the page now, the opposite direction." Or you could have done your left hand, in which case it would have been into the page. Okay. Oh, one more thing about the future of these right-hand rules. There's not just one. And I don't mean like you can do different right-hand rules like I was saying earlier to come up with these. I mean like we're going to get to different situations that have different right-hand rules that tell you different things dealing with this magnetism stuff. Okay? So don't think that's the only right-hand rule you're going to have to learn. All right. So let's take a look at this. So our first particle 
It's going at right angles to a uniform magnetic field. I don't know what direction the magnetic field is pointed or anything like that, but let's just say the magnetic field is pointed up. So here's our uniform magnetic field pointed up, right? It has, it's going at right angles to that magnetic field. So we'll say this is our positive particle here, right? Here's our little positive particle and it's moving in this direction, V, in fact, V1, going like that, right? This is Q1. And therefore, what direction, according to this picture, will the force be? So y'all, yeah, you're looking, it's gonna be out of the page. You're going to go Q, V, just like the one I just did above there. It's going to be out of the page. So the actual mag, the actual force, right, of the actual force is going to be like that, out. Oh, that is, I'm sorry. Out of the page. Okay. Huh? Oh, you want me to sit here and like draw a bold line? I don't think so. Here, it's gonna do like this and it's gonna like curve out towards you and I'll make it like shaded in nice so it looks like nice and 3D for you. How about that, huh? Oh, now that's awesome. Look at that. Woo. There you go, you happy now? It's like it's coming right out at you. It's not what she meant, it's better. I improved on it. All right, so let's take a look at our equation for this. F equals, and here we can just use the magnitude, Q, V, B, sine, theta. In this case, theta is 90 degrees, right? So the force on the first one, uh, charge one, velocity one, this is 90 degrees. So what's the sine of 90? Yep, so it's theta is 90 degrees, therefore sine of theta equals one. So that's what we have right there. So we need to find the strength of the actual magnetic field. That means B equals that force we were given over Q1 times V1. All right, so the force we were given, where was it? 4.25, 4.25 times 10 to the negative three Newtons over a charge of 3.6 microcoulombs. So that's 3.6 times 10 to the negative six coulombs times a speed of 862 meters per second, which will make eight. 0.62 times 10 to the second meters per second. And so you have like a little over four over eight. So that's like a half. So what are we end up with? Like one seventh or something here, which is gonna be like one or point, point one something. What does it turn out to be? But I meant more exactly. What's 4.25 divided by 3.6 times 8.62? Be sure to do the 3.6 times 8.62 all in the denominator. Yeah. Um, so micro it, I did, I made it micro into 10 to the negative six, right? So those prefixes are like a shorthand for the shorthand. So we do scientific notation as a shorthand and then we came up with prefixes as a shorthand to the scientific notation. So whenever you see micro, it just means micro, oops. Micro means times 10 to the negative six. So if I see something like my, you know, a micro coulomb, then that's just a times 10 to the negative six coulombs and a you know, like milli means 
times 10 to the negative three, you know, that's what all those mean. So they're just a shorthand for the shorthand. Kilo means times 10 to the third. So kilogram is a thousand grams, one times 10 to the third grams. Anybody do this division for us yet? So you got 1.4, and then we had 10 to the negative. Did you do the 10 to the negative thirds? Um, I did, yeah. You did? That was included. Yeah. Okay, so 1.4 Tesla then. Does that seem right? 10 to the third. Yeah, it does. It does. Because that gives us a 10 to the negative fourth on the bottom, and then a 10 to the third on the top. That gives us a 10 to the first, and we had already said 0.14, and then so times 10 to the first. So, yep, that works. I like it. Okay, 1.4 Tesla is the strength of that magnetic field. All right, for the next part, they give us a new particle going inside the same magnetic field, so same magnetic field. But this time, it's traveling at an angle of, what was it, 55 degrees? So we have, is it still a positive charge? Yeah. So we have Q2 traveling at an angle like this, that's its velocity, V2. And we're at an angle theta here. We'll call, let's call this one like theta one. And we'll call this one theta two. And theta two is 55 degrees. So now we're still gonna have a force that is pointed out of the page, right? If I look at that V cross to that B field, right? It's still like that, it's still pointed out of the page. Still positive charge, but it's not going to be as strong as it would have been had it been totally perpendicular to the magnetic field. So that's our B field. So we come down here. This was part A, part B. Uh, we need, again, this will be F2 equals cube 2 V2 B sine theta 2. And so we just have to plug all of these in. Q2 in this case is, what was it? 53 microcoulombs, so times 10 to the negative six coulombs, times a speed of 1.3 times 10 to the third meters per second, times our 1.4 Tesla field. Was it 1.4 exactly or were there other? Was it? There were other. So you would save that in your calculator, of course, until you got to the final answer. And then times the sine of 55 degrees. If you plug all of that in, you should get a nice answer in Newtons. Okay, I know it's time to go, so. All right, any questions before y'all take off?